Greetings, Mecky102. In this video, I'm going to talk about a least squares regression technique um, to a custom function for a curve fit in Excel. Um, what I'm showing you here actually is I'm going to perform this regression as an example using the force versus time data from the simple harmonic motion investigation. Uh, I'm actually doing this video uh, in the week where we're doing the simple pendulum motion, which is a damped sinusoid, but I'm going to go back and kind of backtrack a little bit and show you instead for the simple harmonic motion. You'll recall in that investigation we were looking at calculating the period of that motion to therefore connect uh, to find a value for the spring constant that was used in the spring mass system. There we did a pretty manual method of calculating the period. Uh, we could have done the same thing in that case for the for the spring mass system and its simple harmonic motion as we're going to do this week uh, to fit a damp sinusoid to the simple pendulum motion um, so it's the same process the obviously the inputs and some of the units and things will not be the same but the idea is the same so i'll show you in a different context but you'll be able to apply the same exact idea um, to the pendulum motion <clears throat> What I'm showing you here, uh, I've got quite a bit of stuff set up already. You'll have to create some of this setup here, but again, you'll, you, I think you'll be able to see that it's fairly simple to do so. Uh, on the right, I've got a chart, a scatter chart. There's actually two things on here there in the green. These are just markers, no points, but if you remember, there's quite a density of data points for the spring mass system. There's a little over, it's a 10,001 data points. It represents force versus time for 10 seconds. Was, they were calculated or collected at a thousand samples per second. Um, there is actually another one on here on a that's so-called the theoretical to predicted force, the damped sinusoid. But right now, since I've I've uh, got this to kind of restart, they're all showing zero. So that's what this dashed line is here. It's there's it's not showing properly yet, but it will as we add some stuff in. <clears throat> so in the, in the grand scheme of things here, you're all familiar with the notion. If I were to right click or say collect, uh, click on the data right click and say add trend line we've done that for some other investigations what this is doing is it's using what's called a least squares regression technique to calculate the best fit expression or curve to the data that you've selected and there's some pre-programmed ones here exponential linear logarithmic and so forth uh, you can easily convince yourself if you try any of these that they're not in any way shape or form remotely consistent with this notion of a damp sinusoid in fact, I have over here on the left and sort of the, 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 the main area, if you will, the formula that we're fitting. <clears throat> There's, uh, let's see, five different parameters, the amplitude, the damping ratio, the frequency, the phase shift, and then this steady state value for the, for the output. Um, it's not in any way, like I said, the same as what's done in the program pre-available ones, the packaged versions of those trend lines. But although it's not obvious, those are all calculated from the same sort of approach I'm about to show you. They're just built into it. So we need some method to do something like that. <clears throat> this word or this this name, least squares regression, comes from the fact that we are trying to minimize the sum of the squares of the residuals between what we are predicting to be the curve, uh, the, the, the form, the um, Again, that, that theoretical expectation for what the, the shape or the, the trend looks like compared to the measured values. <clears throat> I think it's probably best if I just show the idea here. So again, if you look at the form of this equation, this damp sinusoid, all the parameters, what they represent, I have set up here where I've got under this heading by regression, a place to enter all those values, the amplitude, damping ratio, and so forth. Um, the idea is what we'll do is we'll put initial values for those in the cells and we can come pretty close to that to, to values that are, are reasonable um, that will then fill out the column of numbers here versus predicted so we'll have the data points that were measured so the measured force values and, and I've, I've colored the columns green to kind of highlight that that those are measured values that are put in likewise the mass here was measured so this is a case for 210.3 grams hopefully that again the notion of that is familiar from the investigation on the simple harmonic motion but anyway those are numbers i've entered in here so every one of these times <clears throat> there is the measured force the predicted force at that time will be that which follows from the expression, that theoretical expression for the damp sinusoid. So once I fill in numbers over here for the amplitude and so forth, it's already filled in. I'll show you if I double click on one of these. Uh, I didn't do this. I was expecting it would. So let me come back up here. If I double click, it shows you the, the equation and that it's obviously looking for numbers out of those cells which are currently blank. 
Um, you can also tell here that I've taken the time just for simplicity to actually go and name all the cells that are involved. Okay, so there is if you look at the name box, if I click on these at the top, amplitude, uh, I just gave a, a what is that six letter condensed version of that damp for the damping ratio freak f r e q for the frequency shift <clears throat> and amp eq for the equilibrium value the amplitude it's typically that's referred to as a steady state value but in any event as long as you understand what that represents given long time that's where it would settle down into <clears throat> so in this particular case it's actually sort of convenient that uh I've got this line that showed up here, this dashed line that looks like it's right in the middle of this. So that actually, if, if this were to go on for a longer period of time, that's pretty much where this would end up. So it's around 2.1. So I'm actually gonna enter that number in here for the steady state value. It's more or less the center of where that would come in. When I enter that, you might have seen it already. I'm showing this kind of thick pink line here. So what I've done is, and, and this might be a little unusual, but I've made the line that's going to represent my predicted curve or my theoretical curve, the one that's supposed to represent what I fit, a fairly wide, um, uh, well, it's a curve that's, it's no markers, it's just the lines, um, but fairly wide with a transparent color. And, and the reason being is once this fits, you're gonna see that it's right on top of or right behind it, as it will, as it may be. Uh, all these data points so you actually can't even see it so i purposely made it pretty wide so that when it does come back and it and it fits this this expression the damp sign you show you to the data you'll be able to see that it's there so in any event as i start putting in numbers over here to all these uh, values it should start to look a little bit more um, like the data that you're seeing uh, it may look a little weird in between but in any event <clears throat> So this amplitude, as it's pointed out, uh, refers to the extent over which the, the, the oscillation is occurring. It's a pretty close value, a pretty close estimate to be, that find your first peak, in this case it's around, let's say 2.9, and that's the amplitude refers to the, the sort of the, the difference from your steady state value to that. So if this starts at 2.1, the first peak is around 2.9, so that says your amplitude here is probably about 0.8. So I'll put that in. Again, it hasn't changed anything yet. I'll come back to the damping ratio in a minute. The frequency is probably the next thing we need to really make this look more sinusoidal. So for instance, if I just put in a number there, there you can see that it, uh, now it is actually starting to look like a sinusoid. It has no damping, it has no phase shift, but it has the other elements in there that starts to make it look right. You can see already that my choice in the amplitude looks pretty good because it's, it's achieving about the same peaks and valleys. I don't have to be super accurate here <clears throat> what we're going to do is a numerical method we're going to let excel do the heavy lifting and actually performing the analysis to, to make this fit happen and as it turns out it's an iterative one um, and it is pretty dependent upon initial conditions so i do want to get this to look fairly close before i let it go um, if you don't it could likely just fail and not work properly sometimes even when you're close it might not work but if we can get this red line to look as close as possible to the green data before we start, it will be beneficial. <clears throat> what about the frequency then? Let's put that in here to make it, I just put in a number two, but the way we can find that is if I go, I've got a point here, let me click on this, float over it. Uh, why is it not showing here? Let me float over the peak. Unless there's just, there we go. So. When we were doing this sort of manual period determination in the, the previous investigation on simple harmonic motion, we did not do what I'm about to do here because we couldn't get the accuracy we really wanted. Uh, but that's okay in this case because I don't need, again, I don't need to be incredibly accurate. I just need to be in a pretty good ballpark. So I, I'll take this peak, which is around one second. The next peak over here is around 1.9. So it's about 0.9 seconds for a period. So if I start my frequency here to be equal to two times pi divided by 0.9, so that's the definition that relates the frequency to the period, you can see that gets me very close to that. <clears throat> so it's a little slow actually, because I have the peaks of my predicted are, are not quite as fast as the, the measured. So I might make this, let's make this seven instead of 6.98. That didn't change that much. Let's do 7.2 maybe. You can start to see that by making these changes, I can fit this in a little bit better. So that's looking pretty close as it is. 
Uh, one thing that's off here is the phase shift will change where I start to do the rise or, or the fall or however it may look here. So right now the phase shift is zero. So this starts exactly like a true sine wave would right at zero uh, for the output, in this case of the force for zero time when the real one starts a little higher. So this number here for the phase shift is typically going to be, you know, if it started, if, if instead of having some rise to begin with and it started right at the top of this first peak instead, then my phase shift would be 90, 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians because it would look exactly like a cosine wave. So this is probably somewhere in between here. So let's say I make this equal to pi over 4. <clears throat> let's try that and see what that does. Okay, so that line that up directly to that. The last thing I would have to change is this damping ratio, and that controls how quickly these peaks decay away. And you can see, I, I don't know, actually it's hard to tell because first of all, there's so little damping here. Um, and because of all the parameters, it's hard to really line everything up. Um, I'm gonna say at this point that that's probably extremely close to zero, just so that it doesn't start at zero. Let me put a number in there like 0 0.001. You may not be able to see any impact whatsoever on the curve. Actually, let me show you if I put in a larger number like uh, 0.2. You can see what that does that causes that decay of the amplitude down over time so let me go back i don't want to do that because that's clearly a way off from that so let me put 0 0.002 or something or one whatever you want to do in here i know it's going to be a small number so even what i've got right now looks extremely close to the real thing but i can do better i can actually get this to look you'll see when we're done almost exactly like the measured data <clears throat> this damp sinusoid is a superb representation of the of the behavior we're seeing so the process is I've got now predicted values for these. I want to fit them to be much better than that. And so as I had struck this up, set this up, the reason why you see the graph automatically appears because I had already had a graph, this scatter chart actually, where I had shown the measured force versus time. And then at the same time here, I had constructed another column of values, which simply applies these uh, this damp sinusoid using the values I put in there. So that creates a bunch of data points versus time also show that on the axes. So that's where we're at at this point now. To complete this regression, I need to calculate this sum of the squares of the residuals, it's called. The residual is simply the difference between the predicted value and the measured. The reason it's squared is so that you remove any negative values that might occur. So it doesn't matter what order we take that in. In other words, we're making what's called a positive definite function. We don't care if it's above or below, we just care how much it's off from that. So the simplest way to do it is just to square the value. So I'm gonna make a column of values here that's nothing more than the difference between the predicted and the measured <coughs> squared, whatever that number is, and then I'll double click and copy that down in all the cells, okay? Now, what I want to do is this fit is not a point to point thing per se. It's something that's captured about the overall, the entire set of values. So even though I am calculating in this table the residual squared at each for each data point, I want a measure of that overall. So I've set up over here on the left, I've, I'm highlighting now an area where I'm going to calculate the sum of all of those residuals squared. And I see that I had forgot to change something in here. So let me do that. This should not be degrees squared. That's a leftover from when I did this first in the uh, case of the pendulum. It should be Newton squared, <clears throat> right? Because I'm talking about a difference in force here. So let me fix that. I did fix it on the amplitudes here, but forgot there. So this is nothing more than equal. There's a built-in function in Excel called sum. Open my parentheses. I'm going to add up all of these residuals. Similar thing will work here. If I select the first view, hold shift, control, down arrow, it will grab that entire column. And there, remember, there's 10,001 values there, so there's a lot to select. So that's a pretty handy shortcut here. And then I'll close parentheses and hit equal. So that's a relatively large number. That could be quite large, depending upon how far off you are from the, the, the data with your predicted. So, but don't worry about that. Even if that's a number in the tens of thousands, uh, we'll fix that. The whole point of this method is I want to be able to find what is the minimum value I can get for the sum of the squares of those residuals. Now, if I could get a perfect correspondence at every single point between my predicted and the measured, then that sum of the squares of the residuals would be zero. That's not going to happen, and that's not, it's not realistic that that would happen. But the point is there is some combination of these five parameters that I do expect to give the minimum value for that sum of the squares of the residuals. That's this concept of least squares regression. That's what defines my best fit. 
is finding that minimum value. <clears throat> so that's a very complex numerical method. The way you can do this though is a built-in tool and it is under the data tab. You may or may not have this all the way over. It's called the solver. So let's see here. The way you can set that up is you go to file options. If it doesn't already show up and go to add-ins, I believe that's where it is. And you can say manage Excel add-in, say go. And here are the typical ones. I have analysis tool pack and analysis tool pack for VBA. That turns on a number of what are called the engineering functions. A lot of them happen to be statistics and related. You want to make sure you have a check in the solver add-in. So I already have it there. I'm going to hit OK. Again, to do that, file, options. I believe it's the same on the Mac. I'm not positive. Add-ins. Make sure it says manage Excel add-in. Say go. And make sure there's a check under the solver add-in. There may be other ways to do that. I can't recall them off the top of my head. If you have some problem getting it here, you might search online on how to turn it on. Um, it probably is not selected automatically from your installation. At least it didn't used to be. Anyway, once that's done, I'm going to hit the solver button. It brings up another window and I'll just show you just the very basics of this. You probably don't have to change any of the main settings in here, although there is a fair amount of control. Set objective. This is what we're trying to, the, the, the location of something we're trying to achieve here. And remember our goal is we want to minimize the sum of the squares of the residuals. So if it's not already selected, it is. I'll do it anyways. I'll show you the process. You can click the arrow there and we're going to click on the box that contains the number for the sum of the squares of the residuals. That's something I'm trying to minimize. That's my, my objective is to minimize that cell. So then the next column here, I again, I had already done this, so I'm not sure. I think I think max might be the, the default that shows up, but we want to hit min here because what we're trying to do is that objective we're trying to set to a minimum by changing the variable cells. I'm going to click and expand these. The five parameters that we set in. Okay, I'll expand that out. And that's really it. You shouldn't have to change any other things. You can put constraints on here. You can say make unconstrained variables non-negative. Um, really, I do want these not none of these to be negative, although I will say if your amplitude goes negative, that actually wouldn't uh, be a deal breaker here because it, it can work with it being ne negative. That would just shift. That would change your phase shift. So there's a couple things in there that might that, that might be um, come out a little strange. I don't really want to get in, go into those because it is fairly situation dependent. I'll just su suffice it to say that the close you can kind of get your initial guesses to what you want it to look like, um, the less likely some of these things are going to matter. Uh, I would leave this as a GRG nonlinear that stands for generalized reduced gradient. That is pretty pretty solid workhorse across all of these. Basically, what this is doing is it's a strictly numerical method. And since you have this positive definite function for the sum of the squares of the residuals, think of that as a surface. Like if you had two variables that you were changing here and then your, your sum of the squares of the residuals is a function of those two variables, that by definition is geometrically a surface, mathematically a surface. You're trying to find the valleys in that surface. So we got the same thing here, it just so happens it's more complicated because it's a five dimensional space here because we have five parameters that we can change. But from a mathematical perspective, it doesn't matter whether you, your, your brain can visualize that or not. It simply goes in and tweaks each of these parameters in a methodical way to look down a gradient and find where the valleys are. So a gradient represents the direction of greatest decrease of a function. So it calculates this gradient by using numerical methods, numerical approximations of the derivatives, walks down the gradient to find the valleys. So I've oversimplified the process quite a bit, but that's essentially what it's doing. So in any event, I'll go ahead and say solve here. It might take some time. If all goes well, when it comes back, you might have seen what happened is, now this looks dead on to the numbers, which is why I made this a thick sort of pink line so you can still see that. Um, it actually then also, and I'm gonna not click off of this just yet, um, it did change all these numbers, which it's supposed to, right? Because we gave initial values for that. What it's going to do is come back and do its work. And when it's finished, dump the numbers that it that it solved for over in the cells where, where we were telling it that it could change. That's how it keeps track of this. It actually changes the numbers in the cells as it goes along. You can actually show, I'm gonna hit cancel. I'm gonna say, 
uh, restore original values and hit OK. So it comes back to where it was. So it, 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 this is where I started from. I want to show you some other features of this. You can hit Solver. Um, let me see if I remember how to do this for the GRG nonlinear. Well, here, actually, this is interesting. Forward versus central derivatives. Hopefully, this makes some sense based upon things we did in the past when we were using finite difference approximations to find derivatives. That's exactly what it's doing. You don't have to have a closed form. There is no closed form expression. I mean, there is. We use the damp sinusoid to construct the function values, but Excel doesn't know that. All it knows is it's got 10,001 rows of numbers that when you tweak the input parameters, those change. So it does it has no idea of a functional relationship. It only knows a numeric relationship. Um, there was a way that you can show the results as you go along, and I don't remember how to do that. Maybe you can't do it anymore. I guess not. There used to be a way you can show it as it stepped through. Oh, there it is. All methods. Show iteration results. That, that's I'm going to put a check there. You may not want to always do that, but I think it's interesting here. Uh, if you hit solve, then it will show you each iteration. So it made some changes in there. As you hit continue, I don't know if you can notice that they're tiny changes, but it is modifying numbers as it goes through. And I didn't keep track of however many there were, but as you keep going here, it's modifying the numbers in the sheet as it's searching and it's making an annoying noise. <laughs> you could stop anywhere you want. I think I'm going to stop here just because this is getting a little tedious now. The point is you can see the results if you like to. Something you actually go back and say restore, um, hit OK. One more time I'll show you now that we're back to where we started from, solver. Um, let me go on and un in here uncheck the iteration results because I don't generally want to see that all the time. Okay, I'll hit solve again. Goes through, so it takes a fair number of iterations. There's a lot of data points here, so it, it, I don't know how many iterations it takes. It uh, takes a fair amount of time. Well, it's still seconds, but in the in the scheme of computers today, that's a fair amount of time here. Um, you can do an outline report. I'll hit OK. Now, be careful here. When you hit OK, if you, you generally you do not want to re restore original values, right? You want to keep your solver solution. So I only showed you that so you could kind of see what was happening. I could redo this in general as if it worked, you do not want to do this. You don't want to restore original values. You want to keep the solver solution. But this worked. There will be some scenarios, even if you are fairly close, sometimes it just gets off in the weeds and you may see it come back with something that looks nothing like you expect. In that case, restore your original values and then go back and tweak them until you get a little bit closer and try it again. But as long as it works, which is why it's helpful to be able to see your, your chart here, which it did in this case, you would want to keep the solver solution. I'm going to hit OK. I guess I didn't set that up properly to show the reports. If it did work properly, it would actually, I believe, put them in other sheets here. I must not have uh, clicked that uh, correctly, but that's okay. You could do that if you like. I don't really need to see them because it worked the way I wanted it to. Here are my final values from the fit. Those are the best ones we're going to get. Of most important in this particular case, if you recall, from the simple harmonic motion investigation, what we wanted was a period because by an equation we could relate the period to the spring constant. In this case, we don't get the period, we get the frequency, but that's synonymous with period in the sense that we can easily calculate it. So there's, there's a, a, an equivalent relationship between the frequency of the oscillation and the spring constant. So if you take that, um, plug it into the expression, you will get down here as I showed the calculated value from this approach. It tells us that the spring constant we predict it to be 10.74 newtons per meter. If you look from the manufacturer, the WB Jones Spring Company, they say 0 0.06 pound force per inch, which converts to 10.51 newtons per meter. That's a 2.2% difference. So it's pretty good. Um, the key element of this is it took some time to set this up, but once it's set up, all the heavy lifting really is done by solver and Excel. 
I'm not having to zoom in or find multiple period points or anything like that. And as always, I could actually right click at the bottom, copy this sheet. Okay, I could do a different mass. I have another data file open for the 110.1 gram. So I'll come in, shift control down arrow, select all of these data, copy. So it's 110.1 grams. Let me remember that. I'll come in, I'm gonna just go to home and say paste special values only. It's 0 0.1101 kilograms. Now you'll notice it, there's a, it has the same values that I had before for all of these uh, starting points. That no longer matches up well um, to the, the, the measured data for this particular mass. So I'm gonna have to go in, reset uh, my min and max on Y. Okay. And then let's tweak this again. It looks like the frequency is still fairly decent, but now I wanna be around 1.1 for my equilibrium value. My amplitude is gonna be more like maybe 0.35 or so. That looks pretty good. What about the frequency? So the first peak here is at 0.751. And let's see, this is my, the next peak there, well, at least the one that I'm looking at. So 0.751, this is 1.34. So what is that, 0.6? So we get equals two times pi divided by 0 0.6. If I did that right, that looks pretty good. We have some discrepancy in the middle there. I might try this where it's at. This looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and try this. I get, again, I have a larger sum of the squares of residuals to begin with here. That's okay. Let's go back into data solver. Now I copied this sheet, but the solver still keeps, in this case, the relative arrangement of things. I still have that my objective cell is still appearing properly. You can verify it if you want or just redo it just to make sure. I've got those five cells, B5 to B9, yeah, still selected. By the way, it doesn't reflect in here the names I assigned to them. That's fine, it doesn't matter. Leave everything as it is, I'll hit solve. See what it does, hopefully it can come back. I'm a little farther off here now to start with, so it might take a little bit longer. It did work because now I can see that it came back and found that. I'll hit OK, keep the solver solution. So now we have radically different, well, not radically, but definitely different values than we did for the other mass. Um, but same process following through, we get a predicted or calculated K here, measured value of it 10.57 compared to the manufacturer's value 10.51, a 0.6% difference. So. Aside from the fact of having to, to load the data in, um, do some work here to change my starting values. This is a pretty quick way to analyze this particular mass that was certainly easier than finding five more uh, predicted values for the, the period by using that sort of manual approach. But it's not necessarily better or worse than the results in the end. Um, in some ways, this is only a single value from this single trial versus the other one had a lot more capabilities in that sense, but it's it's certainly fine. Um, I should also point out here, the residuals squared are showing zeros. They're, they're just small enough that I should probably reset this to display scientific notation. But in any event, uh, they're small and added up, we still get here. This is quite good actually, a 0.1935 for the sum of the squares of the residuals, over 10,001 data points, that's pretty good. I will show you one more thing too. Let me come back in here and I'll go to the pendulum motion. Uh, and yes, I have this same analysis done. A little bit more added into it. So the same 210.3 kilograms, it should look very similar. The only thing that's different on this version of the spreadsheet is I had to add another column here, what I call the deviation squared. Um, you're probably used to seeing with trend lines, curve fits, this so-called so coefficient of determination, the R-squared value that, that talks about the goodness of fit. I have a few other uh, cells that I added on the left as well as that column of the deviation squared, I called it. There are ways that you can go through and calculate the coefficient of determination to match up. Um, I didn't go into that. It's a little bit complex to explain, so I left it out. This is... Uh, 
Again, I have to change some of my units in here. These are not where they're correct in the column headings up in the table, but they're not correct over here. But for the time being, if we don't worry about that too much, I definitely should fix that. Um, but let's just focus on the results here. I get a coefficient of determination R squared va value of 0.9999. You're probably used to the fact that uh, the closer you are to one, the better the fit. Uh, it goes without saying this is an excellent fit. You can actually see how good it looks by comparing the, the curves on the graph or on the scatter chart over there. Um, I should point out though, it's it's kind of well known that the more data points you fit, that just kind of artificially, somewhat artificially pushes that R squared value closer to one. So uh, it can make it look better than it is. But I think no matter how you argue this, that is an excellent fit to the data. And it does a pretty good job of that. So that's your, introduction to using the least squared regression let me go back to the sort of the standard version if you will that that uh, you'll use for your work that doesn't have all that calculation of r squared uh, but just the general idea is you'll set up some area where you you determine uh, initial starting values for the five input parameters to this damp sinusoid you'll construct a column of predicted values using those numbers this column of the residual squared for each row, for each uh, point in the measured data. Uh, some of the sum of all those residuals squared and then use the solver to find your least squares regression fit to that. Uh, there, of course, in the pendulum motion, you'll be determining the acceler local acceleration of gravity, not K, but other than that, that's just a, a, a fairly, it also uses the frequency. So you're just doing a slightly different calculation. So thanks for watching.